Well, it's always good to be back here at a lens conference. Um, and I will say also surprising, normally they put the ethics at the beginning, right? So everybody can sleep in a little bit. But obviously, some of you still need your CLE credits. Um, for you law students, I'm not sure why you're here. Um, and uh, But uh, w hopefully you'll have a, a good time um, as well. Uh, you'll also learn, law students, uh, that this is really important. You have to go the full 60 minutes. Otherwise, I'll have some very upset people, right, um, who want that CLE uh, ethics credit uh, here today. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about guardians of code and conscience. That's an awesome title, isn't it? Generative AI produced this title for me. Creative, looks good, uh, pulls it together in a way that I would have never, this would have been like generative AI and ethics. Here's your CLE credit if I had been responsible for it. Uh, so not bad. Not bad. Uh, if you can compare that. Um, this is my disclaimer. Um, that, uh, that usually every single military speaker has to do. It's boring. It was written by my public affairs officer. Okay. Um, no generative AI here. Uh, but, uh, but with that, I'd like to start a little bit by actually taking, where are all my law students, um, or undergraduate students? Raise your hand. I'm going to take you back to a time long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away when these <laughs> We're in the library, and I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment and envision you're a 1L, and you haven't been issued a password for Westlaw or Lexus. In fact, back in the Stone Ages when I went to law school, you didn't get one of those until you could prove that you could shepherdize, key sight, do everything you needed to with only this ancient text we called books. <laughs> they stuck you in the library for a month. You were running around from shelf to shelf, floor to floor, demonstrating that you knew how to use this tool. And I know that many of you are horrified right now, but you couldn't just click and then magically pull up any number of other materials and data and information. How, why would they do that to you? I'm here to tell you that that same horror is what you are going to feel like, or law students are going to feel like, another some number of decades later, when you're my age and they start thinking about generative AI. Because as opposed to a headline when we were shocked that a lawyer used generative AI to create a brief and turn it in, they're going to wonder, what did you ever do before you were issued a tool, an AI tool, along beside you the day that you started law school? That day is much closer than you think. And why do I say this? Because ChatGPT has already figured out how to pass the bar. And it didn't go through three years of legal training. ChatGPT4 is at a 90% passage rate of the bar exam. And it didn't spend a day in a general Dunlap lecture. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so this idea, this notion that generative AI is here is something that I would encourage us to not be afraid of, but instead to embrace. In fact, this is a small snapshot of generative AI legal tools that are already at your disposal. Organizations, software packages like FileVine, I got to talk to that founder out in Silicon Valley last fall. Um, he's actually out of Utah. But what it does is essentially goes on top of all of your email and databases. And it pulls out materials and information to keep you on track and on target. It crafts email responses for judges. It allows you to stay up to date with what's going on in your legal practices. Or case text, I talked to that founder as well. 
he got early access in, uh, with OpenAI and ChatGPT and ChatGPT 1, version 1, version 2. He's like, no, nah, not ready yet. By version 3, before it was released to the public, he went, whoa, this is different. We can actually revolutionize legal research and legal writing. Understanding what discovery and document under, uh, uh, review looks like. I will tell you that these are going to continue to proliferate. So it's here. And now the question is, how do you understand it? Um, when I talked to these founders in Silicon Valley, they told me something similar to this quote. Because I asked them, is, are lawyers going to be eradicated from the planet? And they all told me something similar to this, but I liked uh, Law Technologies today's uh, quote because it was a little more succinct. AI won't replace lawyers, at least not yet. But lawyers who use AI are going to replace those who don't. And make no mistake about it. I'm talking to an audience that is mostly comprised of national security professionals, and I also know that the United States government, as well as most other governments, are really slow. I'm here to tell you that if we don't embrace this rapidly, we are going to be run circles around. Because those who use AI are going to be doing and executing law faster and cheaper so it is not that lawyers or litigation is going to go away. I would predict it is going to be more prolific. It is going to be more cost effective. I don't think I have a room full of acquisition lawyers, but let me go ahead and share with you. I believe that protests are going to go up. Why? Because litigation is going to be cheap for corporations. If we don't get our arms around and get on the leading, bleeding edge of generative AI, I believe that our JAG cores and our national security apparatus are going to be woefully behind. So this is supposed to be a talk about ethics. Um, and so you can get your CLE credits. So we are going to not only first understand generative AI, but then we're going to walk our way through several hypotheticals and think about um, the ethical rules as applied. At the very end, I'll give you some traps, takeaways, and tips um, uh, that, are, uh, that are my uh, uh, impressions um, based on, on some reviews of generative AI. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of, of time for discussion. Um, and I'm going to start with a pretty in-depth conversation about what generative AI is. And part of this is based on my own experience. I was, like you, sir, um, in desperate need of CLE at the end of last year. It was my year to, uh, and so I'm like, hey, Gerald Dunlap asked me to come, uh, come speak. Um, I'll just go ahead and purchase a few of these uh, uh, CLEs um, on generative AI uh, from the ABA. One was quite good. The other I was screaming at. Why? Because the lawyers and judges that they brought in to talk about generative AI had no idea what they were talking about. I'm here to tell you that 1.1 demands, demands that we actually learn something about the underlying technology. It's even been written into the comment, comment eight. And this isn't new. This is 2012 that we are required to keep abreast of law, changes in law and its practice, to include new technology. And I know some of you are going, yeah, but ma'am, I'm in law school because I really didn't like math. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to know these ones and zeros. I never took a comp sci class. Where are my cadets? All of you took a comp sci class. Okay, You can do it, even if you don't like math. Okay, um, and you do not have to be an astronautical engineering major to understand or, and I believe, to have an ethical obligation to understand these types of words. And it's not enough to go, well, they all mean about the same thing. You have got to dig in 
and understand what the difference is between AI and machine learning, what neural networks are, why it matters, what a large language model is, and how it can fail. So before you all look at me like the robot that's in the top left, we're going to go through at a very simplified level. And by the end of this, you're all going to be happy. And you're going to be like, I can at least sort of explain artificial intelligence. All right, so let's dig in. AI is not new. You can get a lot of different definitions of artificial intelligence, but let's break it down to just some real simplified aspects. It's computer systems that predict things. And it's actually pretty, and it depends on the system about how well it actually makes those predictions. There are lots of systems that predict things. Anyone have one of those old uh, uh, eight balls? Remember you did, when you shook them and you looked and you had an answer. That was a prediction. It was pretty lousy, but it's a prediction. Okay. So think about artificial intelligence as opposed to the eight ball. It's a computer system that is going to spit out a prediction. We have had these since Eliza. This is in the 60s. Okay. Eliza was a series of rules, a series of models. And you could amazingly type things in like, Due to ongoing exams in college, I have a lot of stress. And what Eliza would do is it would pick up on this thing called, ooh, stress. I know what I need to respond now. Stress has to do with lack of sleep. You're not relaxed enough. And so it would spit out, please relax a little. Sleep well. People thought it was amazing. It was really just a form of classical AI, a model-based rule set that allowed for inputs to then go through a model base and rules type of system to create outputs. What's really good at, at classical AI? Things like games, okay? things that have rule sets, things like chess. We beat the grandmaster of chess, AI did, in 1997. AI has been around for a long time. So what's changed? One of the things that's changed is as opposed to classical AI, that was model driven, where the stuff inside the eight ball had to do with rule sets. Now the things inside the eight ball have to do with data. And that is what you take when you move AI and you go to a subset of artificial intelligence called machine learning. Machine learning is simply an artificial intelligence system that now is using data as its central components, not a set of rule-based or model-based. So what's the prime example of this? Well, AlphaGo. AlphaGo was a system that allowed, it was artificial intelligence that was using machine learning, and it played millions upon millions of games against itself. And it tried to understand and look at what are those patterns, what are those principles that is beginning to understand about the game of Go. We didn't put in the rules about Go. The machine learning just had the data. And what did it do? It developed strategies that no human had ever seen before. And it played a game against the premier Go player. And early in the game, the machine did something that no human had ever seen. They went, ooh, that was weird. We haven't seen that tactic before. And it was only several moves later that everyone went, oh. It created an approach that humans had never seen before. Why? because it had played more games than any other living soul and identified patterns and capabilities and correlations. That is what machine learning is all about. So let's break down machine learning into its basic components. Machine learning requires a task. It then needs a whole lot of training data. And then you add a learning model. Okay, and so we're gonna break this into very simple terms that even a law student who never wants to take another math class can understand. You ready? Okay, the task. 
is their car in this image? A task is just a problem. It's a question that we want something with machine learning to help us figure out. The answer to this is pretty easy for you. So how, do we t how does machine learning go about determining whether or not there is a car in this image? Well, we give it a whole lot of training data. We start with things like this, cars. And then we give them things like this, not cars. And we allow it to learn. Sounds pretty easy, right? What has a car? I hope everyone goes, well, but that wasn't really what I asked. Oh, was it not? You asked, is there a car? Yes, yes. And yet all of you go, but that's not really what you meant. This starts to underline the challenges associated with machine learning. You better be really specific about the task that you want to solve. Because otherwise, the training data that you use may not yield the result that you want. And I've got a, a story maybe that I'll get to in question and answer about uh, tuberculosis and uh, machine learning uh, if we get a chance. All right, so then we get to this learning model. So we've got the task. We've got, uh, we've got a good, well-defined task. We've got some training data. And then we get to the learning model. And very simplistically, because we're not going to go into a computer science class today, you get an image. This is the eight ball, okay? There's some AI system. It's got a bunch of parameters and weights and determinations or functions that are going on in there. Go take a computer science class if you want to learn what actually happens. And then it spits out an answer. Except this is not at all what a computer looks like. A computer doesn't look at this as a bunch of pixels. A computer looks at this image as numbers. And not only does it look at it as numbers over here, it spits a number out over here. We're the ones who then interpret a one as a yes. And so it is that numerical statistical understanding that is really taking place in here. It's a series of weights, of probabilities, of functions, all having to do with numbers. That is what the learning model is. And computer scientists got smart after a little while, and they said, OK, well, this isn't too bad. But you know what? What thinks really, really well? Like the most amazing computer system that we know that learns, it's this squishy thing. And they started to look at humans. And they started to look at how humans approach tasks and training data and learning models. And they went, huh. Humans don't have one set of inputs to yield one output. They actually have layers upon layers of neurons. And so computer scientists looked at the brain, your brains, to understand and to then model how might we make machine learning a little bit more like a human brain. And they came up with this idea and these sets of principles called neural networks. And all neural networks are is layers of those connections. So let's break a neural network down um, into its simplest parts. So neural networks are simply a type of machine learning that allows interconnections to then be layered and create an output. So if you think about a neural network as a single neuron, this is a single unit, we have inputs. In this case, we have 64 and 8. Those are my inputs. We then do some sort of function or connection. We have some sort of weighting between those inputs. All right, so we got 64 times 2, 8 times 0.5. For those brainiacs in the room, you know output 132. That function is an addition function, in addition to a multiplication function. This is one unit. This is a neuron. What a neural network then does is layer those. And all of a sudden, we have inputs that have different connections between each other in order to produce an output. All of a sudden, you have an amazing amount of computer power, an amazing amount of machine learning 
that is allowing relationships and patterns to be discovered. This is when you hear neural network, it's all this is. Now when you hear the term deep neural networks, think a whole, whole lot of them. The complexity gets deeper. The amount of connections get deeper. And so deep neural networks just mean that we start to multiply and amazing things start to happen. In fact, I was at a course up at MIT in January and there was a PhD um, who was describing this. Um, and he actually says, we don't really know how it truly works, but it does. There's some sort of magic that does actually take place when you create these deep neural networks. And now we've moved from deep neural networks to something that ChatGPT uses, something called a transformation algorithm, um, which is based on this loosely. But for that, you'll need to go to a better computer science class than this one. So how do you train one of these? We take the same task, right? We got a car. Then we add this neural network. Okay, It has all these connections, and it says no car. And then we do this thing called supervised learning, and we say, wrong answer. Okay? That is not correct. Okay? And then it goes back, and it modifies the parameters and the weights until this output becomes consistent in identifying that this image is a car. Training an AI system takes an incredible amount of time. It also then requires an incredible amount of data. And oh, by the way, it's brittle. We'll get to that a little bit um, towards the end when we talk about hallucinations, when we talk about issues associated with data um, and vulnerabilities that we need to protect against from a national security perspective. All right. Now we'll get to the title of this presentation. So what in the world is generative AI? Well, the task we've been talking about so far, is this a car, isn't creating anything. What generative AI does is that it actually, the task is to create new things. It could be an image. It could be text. It could be video. It could be video. Not the wonky ones you've been seeing, but the next generation of AI is going to be disturbingly real. Generative AI is about creativity, about allowing machine learning to produce something that hasn't been produced before. But it follows this same basic approach. And since we're lawyers and we're not as interested in images, we really like words, um, we're going to walk through generative AI with respect to text and how it works. So let's take a task. How about the task is generate the content of this lecture? Okay. All right. I want to talk about AI. Okay. So that is the, the problem set that I'm going to give my machine learning, my generative AI. Generate my text. I'm going to give it some training data. Okay. Um, these are three paragraphs or short sentences um, about AI randomly pulled from the internet. And then I'm going to apply the learning model. I want you to find every, I want to start a sentence that starts with AI. What's the next word? It's really at its root what language models are doing. Predict the next word. So it goes through and it finds every example of AI and it finds the next word. There are two is's, two that's, then there's a develop, a has, and an impact. And then all it does is flip a coin. What's the highest level of probability? Well, it's either is or that. So we're going to pick that. What word comes after that? We're going to go through and find all the that's in this training data. Well, this gets a little sticky. Well, those are four different words. Not sure. They're all equally probable. And the system picks one. This is the result. And this would be a really lousy lecture, AI that have taken place in a changing environment, the latest manifestation of AI that interact with users. This is lousy. 
This would not pass General Dunlap's law class, okay? It doesn't sound coherent. It doesn't make a lot of sense, okay? So how do we improve reliability and function here? We add more networks, that neural network, those layers. So how about, as opposed to understanding what is the next word, what if I take the last three words to predict the next word? What if the last four words to predict the, ne the next word? Or in the case of ChatGPT, what if I take the last 4,000 words to predict the next word? What if the training data is more words than you've heard in a lifetime? And I want to give you a sense of just how much training data ChatGPT is using. A two-year-old kid has heard about 15 million words in his or her lifetime. That's actually quite a lot of words, okay? Some get repeated more often than others, like stop, no, right? That, that makes up a lot of those 15 million words, all right? Um, BERT, which was an early version by Google um, of, of generative AI, was trained on a billion that was in 2018. ChatGPT, 10 billion. The version of ChatGPT that was released in 23, 100 billion. All right, you're like, well, that's a two-year-old. I've heard a lot of words, okay? All right, so I wanna see how many of you are avid readers. Oh, there we go. All right, now, oh, you're gonna be my new favorite. You ready? All right, so let's say that in the course of your lifetime, what, you read about a book a, a book a week? Okay. All right. We'll do, we'll do a book a week. You can keep up that pace, a book a week, for your entire life. That means you're going to read about, on an average, I'm, I'm even going to allow you to, you know, I'm going to assume you started reading on your own, you know, maybe when you were out 10, you know, picking up lots of books then. I'm going to assume you're going to live, live a nice, long life. You're going to have 80 plus years of reading books, even 90. Okay. In your lifetime, if you average a book a week, you're reading about 4,160 books total. I hate to break it to you, that's only about two gigabytes worth of data in your lifetime. Let's compare the amount of data that ChatGPT has been reading between versions. You were basically, in your lifetime, could have gotten to ChatGPT1. And that's if you're really crushing books. Every week, averaging at least books that are 250 to 300 pages. Okay? Crushing books. And you never take a break, ever. Maybe maybe you might get up to about two gigs. So you gotta increase that productivity if you wanna get to four. ChatGPT2, released in February of 19, 40 gigabytes of data. I don't care which of you raised your hand about being an avid reader, you're not doing it. Let's take ChatGPT3, 753 gigabytes of data. ChatGPT4 that was released last year, they didn't tell us. The estimates are that they're above a terabyte of data. They are going to run out of the internet. And I'm serious. So what do they do then? They then generate data. They create data because data is what drives reliability. This is the speed and the scale of what is going into, and when we talked about those parameters, right? Remember those little weightings and connections? Last GPT-3 was at 175 billion parameters. And yet, and yet, despite how good this is, it still hallucinates. Write a four-sentence biography for Linnell Latendra. My name is not common. 
In fact, I'm probably the only one. I have tried to find this person, trailblazing entrepreneur, um, sustainable fashion, um, <laughs> founded Echo Conscious, Conscious clothing brand at the age of 25. I was doing something at 25, but it had nothing to do with this. Um, I don't know what this is. I've tried to find this person. She doesn't exist. Okay. Um, so chat GPT can still hallucinate. And you need to understand the why. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. All right. It's probably time that we actually start talking about more model rules for professional conduct than just 1.1. Okay. So let's understand why this is so important to the legal profession and get into some hypotheticals. So one of the reasons it's so important, and you might ask yourself, well, why law? Why don't they go pick on some other profession, right, and, and apply generative AI there? Law is ripe for generative AI. I mean, I, I, I hate to break it to you, but we've got clearly defined rules. Uh, people ask me all the time, what's the best undergraduate major you can have in order to go to law school? And I say engineering. Why? It's a series of rules. There's flow charts. You can do if-then statements all day long. You can code constitutional law, and I actually do it with my Law 220 class. Okay, my double E's love it. My legal studies major is not so much. Okay, um, it has a bunch of repeatable processes. It has enormous amounts of data, and data that we can put into specific piles and say, this is about this. That's what that whole key site thing was that us uh, more mature people remember using. Okay, Lots of authoritative text, and I hate to break it to you, you're not creative writers. You all write the same way. Facts, issue, rules, analysis, conclusion. Generative AI and the law, it's like a match made in heaven. So let's understand how we match that to some hypotheticals. Because I'll tell you, I got really angry, as I mentioned, listening to one of the ABA presentations, and the answer was, well, you can never use generative AI and be ethical. Like, are you kidding me? So let's walk our way through this hypothetical. It's 1500 on a Friday afternoon before a long holiday weekend, and you are a brand new JAG, and you have been crushed this week with legal assistance, clients, ethics, opinions for the wing commander, and your deputy SJ walks into your office, and you start talking about your amazing plans for this weekend. She casually asks you if you've submitted that response to the defense counsel's motion, um, and in a jolt of panic, you realize you haven't even started, and it's due at 1600 the deputy then casually walks out of the uh, office and says, well, you can always use chat GPT. What rules? What ethics rules, what rules of professional responsibility do you need to be thinking about in answering the question, well, should I go use chat GPT? This is the audience participation time. And I know I've got a 3L somewhere. Yes, ma'am. It's whether you're using it as an aid or simply that you're going to submit the exact motion that ChatGPT gives you. Nice. So am I going to use it as an aid, as a starter, or am I going to just submit it without looking at it? Okay. And I am not going to uh, t uh, ask you the follow-up, Faith, because she's an undergrad. Okay. <laughs> she hasn't taken the model rules yet. Where's my 3Ls? Or and competence. So, and in, in describe, so 1.1, the competency rule. Okay, what, what about competence do I need to know? Um, can you know that you're representing your client effectively? Um, so, can you trust AI to like create based on like legal citations that you can trust, full real cases, um, reliable case law? Um, no, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, can I trust it to pull the right things? Do I have enough knowledge to know whether or not it's pulled the right things? So 1.1, competence. What other rules? In the back, yes, sir. Yeah, confidentiality. Nice, how so? I'd be 
Nice, you've skipped ahead to like, like hypothetical number three, but I appreciate it, so absolutely. Um, so confidentiality, especially if I've got a client, okay? In this case, I'm, the, you know, I'm representing the government. You know, I don't know whether or not I've got any private data in here, but I might, and that's something that I need to think about, okay? What else? Yes, ma'am. Ah, how so? Just so everybody knows, she's a former student of mine. Well done, Dana. So um, uh, diligence, okay? Understanding and going back and making sure that I'm, I'm following up and, and taking a look there. Anybody else have any concerns? I don't know. Who in this room is about to go be a deputy SJA? Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I, I, I. so what are you worried about? Yeah, well done. That's my exec, by the way. Um, um, we need to probably think about responsibilities of the supervising attorney. Okay, the whole, hey, have you thought about using ChatGPT and then walking out the door, not asking any follow-up questions? I mean, hello, 5.1, you know, big warning lights, right? All right, so these uh, these are the rules, I think, you know, competence, diligence, you've all talked about them, um, that apply as equally to chat GPT as they do to a new attorney that you're supervising. So it's not that you can't use generative AI. And in fact, I would argue that potentially if this attorney had a generative AI tool, they might not have been in this situation in the first place. Why? Because there are now generative AI tools like FileVine that would have warned this attorney before 1500 on a Friday that this brief was coming due. So query, does competence actually demand that you start to look at these tools and invest in these tools? I'll leave that as an open-ended question for you. Other issues or questions that I would want to be asking myself, what are this jurisdiction's rules? Are there any limitations? Do I have any particular candor to the tribunal that I need to provide um, if I'm using chat GPT? And I'm here to say that there have actually been some jurisdictions that in early reactions uh, to generative AI were like, you can never use it. They pulled back. We've even had, do I have any wonderful Navy folks here? just because I really want to pick on you. Navy postgraduate school, when uh, the generative AI was first released, issued a policy letter. You may not use any sort of generative AI. Talk about the wrong approach. They've rescinded it, by the way. Um, I think maybe we should have just asked for an extension. Um, but before we get into chastising this particular, you know, young jag about using generative AI, I think we need to be asking questions like, how much prior experience do you have with this issue? Can I, to your point, actually read what, gen uh, what is produced by the, by the generative AI and go, you know what, actually, it's good here, it's good here, but I need a little bit more here. How much experience does the individual have with chat GPT or some sort of generative AI? Which version? Is it the free one? By the way, all things free? Okay, means that there is something more that you're not paying for. Okay, um, and I kind of want the best if I'm going to be submitting it to a court. Uh, and so I think there's an, any number of issues of uh, being able to recognize when is something hallucinating, when is it not, when is this real, when is it not. But the answer in this old ABA CLE that I listened to at the end of last year was, well, because you don't know the answers to any of these things, the answer should just be no. I am here to tell you that that is a bad approach. We need to find ways in which we can leverage this tool, leverage this technology, and do so well within our rules of professional responsibility. So let's turn 
to the next hypothetical. It's now 1505. You've been dwelling on this for a full whopping five minutes. Okay, and you were just about to create a login for ChatGPT, meaning the answer to my prior question of how much experience, not good. Okay, this also means it's the old version. Okay, and your brand new three level, level paralegal walks into your office, he's beaming with pride, and he hands you a draft response to the defense counsel motion, which is now due in 55 minutes. And you are so grateful, you start to scan that argument, and you think, holy cow. That JAG school, they're doing some amazing things. I haven't even seen some of these CAF cases before. Who would have thought a senior airman would have such skill? Problems? <laughs> what rules? Oh, this is always the one that trips through. Uh, yes. Diligence, absolutely, okay? Um, your own diligence, okay? We, we then apply that diligence as, as an attorney for when we are also supervising non-lawyer assistants. There's particular things and expectations that we have as attorneys under 5.3, okay? And they look like this. Okay. This still applies. It just applies in a different context. And this isn't new. I was once the chief of appellate law. And I had amazing attorneys, captains, okay, who would hand me legal briefs, most response motions, and they go, ma'am, it's good. You don't really need to look at this. I pulled it out of a motion bank. And so what did I do? Because I'm that supervising attorney? I checked their sites. I didn't use red pen. I'm nice. I use blue. Okay? <laughs> All over their motion. Wrong page. Incorrect citation. This quote isn't in there. The same thing and rules apply if you're using generative AI. And if you're and now because this is so ubiquitous, you need with your assistants, your non-legal assistants, to set some expectations up front and early. When and how are they allowed to use it? What are their responsibilities if they do? For starters, they need to tell you. And you've got to create an environment in which they will. You have to teach them about the things that work and this thing, and sometimes that it doesn't. You have to use the example of Linnell Latendra, the eco-conscious fashion designer, okay? <laughs> and help them to know when it's okay, when it's not, and what are those guardrails and parameters by which we will leverage this tool. You also have to be able to recognize the warning signs. And in this case, the whole Wow, I've never seen those calf cases before. Should have been a really big red flag. All right, now to my gentleman who is getting me far, far ahead. We finally get to hypothetical number three. Flash forward three years, you're in a similar predicament on Friday afternoon. By the way, this is a trend. This is a problem. Um, except you're now a victim's counsel. And you've used chat GPT to help you write briefs for years, and no one's been any the wiser. That's a problem. Um, this time, though, you need to include some of your clients' medical information to support your legal arguments. Can you put it in chat GPT? In the back, sir. Not if you want to keep your license. Not if you want to keep your license. All right, and what rules do I need to be thoughtful about here? Confidentiality. Communication expectations with my client. Candor to the tribunal. I think generative AI is going to pose some interesting questions about how we communicate with our clients. I'd like you to envision for a time, the first time you sit down with your client and go, just so you know, sometimes I leverage generative AI to help me write my briefs. Really? 
I thought I was paying you for that thing that's framed on your wall. Okay? You are going to have to understand why it's actually to their advantage for generative AI to go through document review versus you. When is it a good thing? What are the examples where it is actually more capable and more cost effective than handing it to a human to do? That understanding and that ability to communicate why you're using, in what circumstances you're using, and how you then still have the competence and diligence to review will need to be a conversation that you add to your lexicon. With respect to confidentiality, this too is not new. You've hit technology questions about privacy of your client's information before. In fact, there is a great uh, a technology opinion um, by the California State Bar that was published actually back in 2010 that gives any number of tech factors. And while not binding on any of you unless you're a California attorney, I'd encourage you to go pull this one. It's 2010-179. California walks through in a multi-page opinion about how one might use and leverage certain factors to be able to understand issues relating to confidentiality and client's data. Candor to the court. More and more jurisdictions are creating rules and responsibilities on what your obligations are to then tell the judge in what way chat generative AI has been used in your legal responses. Understanding what those requirements are, and if you're a judge, what requirements are you going to impose? What information do you want to know? Is it simply whether or not they use generative AI? If so, I don't think you're thinking deeply enough as a judge. I think you need to be thinking about asking the version type, the way in which you protected uh, confidentiality. I think there's all sorts of requirements and issues associated with the type of candor for the court that we should be demanding as a judge and expecting and providing as an attorney. Because there are different types of generative AI. There's the generic kind that you can go out and Google and then there are a number that are specific, that have firewalls built in, where you can keep client data protected over here. And then you can add these tools to help generate things that stays within your ecosystem. Guess what? That's not free. Okay. And so you must understand what are your ethical responsibilities with respect to implementing and leveraging these tools. All right. So I'm, now I'm just going to get on uh, the last couple of minutes that I have uh, to some traps, takeaways, and tips. Notice the alliteration? I did that all on my own. OK. All right. Um, traps and limitations. We spent probably, when I was at the AI course uh, for senior leaders in January, and we had a PhD from MIT, we spent about three hours going through all of the ways that AI can fail. You ended the lecture going, oh my gosh, I'm never going to use this. Okay. There's a lot of ways they can fail. We've talked about hallucinations, but at every stage of this machine learning, there is a vulnerability. Um, the output quality depends on task specification. Here, I'm going to fast forward a couple. Write four sentence biography for Brigadier General Latendra. Task specification, all I did is add seven letters. And look at this output. This is beautiful. Steadfast dedication to duty and unwavering leadership has earned a widespread respect. I love chat GPT. <laughs> OK? And the only difference between those two was this. How you think, now by the way, some of this still isn't right, um, uh, but how you think about the task that you're asking, there's a new term that you need to put in your lexicon. It's called prompt engineering. If you don't know how to do it or what that means, that means you don't haven't explored enough about where generative AI works and where it doesn't. All right, let me go backwards. All right. Um, your outputs 
are also going to mirror the same biases that were in your training data. Okay. Machine learning is susceptible to the enemy as well. So from a national security standpoint, you need to understand not only to make sure that you're defending the data, but you're also defending the model. Because you may not know about those vulnerabilities until you're, you've actually fielded a system. Knowing what information and questions you need to be asking your clients from a national security perspective relies on you understanding these systems and how they work in the first place. All right. And then I'll close with some takeaways and tips and leave a couple of minutes uh, for some questions. I believe you need to be an early adopter. If you are a leader in this national security space, then you need to push your folks. For my budget next year, I am taking a percentage off the top, and that money will only be spent on generative AI in the education space. For my departments to earn back part of their budget, they have to be telling me how they are going to leverage and explore in generative AI, how they are going to develop cadets who know how to use it, not how to be afraid of it, okay? Where it's uh, pros and its cons are. You need to demystify. Okay? The more times I've heard senior leaders walk in and say, just, just shake some AI on it. Right? Sprinkle, sprinkle AI and this magical stuff happens. By the way, last night I created this image. I put it in a, in a, in a generative AI image maker and I said, I want a salt shaker that spits out AI and it did this. Isn't that cool? Okay? Um, demystify. You can't just sprinkle AI on something. Okay, you've got to be thoughtful about the models and the data and the training that you use. You need to practice. I've already talked about prompt engineering. You need to teach delegation as a skill set. The questions that you ask these systems, the better they are, the better the response will be. You need to know how to review and in what circumstances you need to review and why. That means you need to be a good delegator, not to humans, but also to be a good delegator to machines. And finally, as a leader, you need to establish some friction points for generative AI. What are the guardrails that you are going to put on your units and their use of this? It is those guardrails that will prevent the young JAG from taking the really amazing motion that the young paralegal made. So with that, I'll close. If you're not convinced yet that AI isn't going to replace you, okay, I don't think it will for a while. But it does have the very real possibility that if you don't embrace it soon, someone else is going to run circles around you. And what I hope is that those people running circles around us are not our enemies. With that, sir. Thank you very much. I'm about to utter words that I've never said in a conference before. Take some more time, Lynette. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? Uh, Diane? This is a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And you got your full 60 minutes of CLE. <laughs> yes. <so. laughs> My name is Diane. I'm a 3L at Harvard Law School. I have a question about Rule 5.3 and how it applies. So we talked a lot about Rule 1.3, which covers diligence. Mm -hmm. Rule 5.3 covers responsibilities regarding non-lawyer assistance. Yes. In my mind, you know, you, you teed us up with a really great hypothetical two, overseeing a human paralegal. I wonder what your thoughts are on Rule 5.3 applying to us overseeing ChatGPT as a non-legal system. I, I think that's the exact way that you should be thinking about ChatGPT, is really thinking of it as a non-lawyer assistant. And so if you would be doing certain things um, uh, with a brand new paralegal, um, you better be doing that with ChatGPT. And this is why I think that it shouldn't be so scary to use it. We've all had brand new paralegals before, or we will someday for you law students. Okay. You know how to deal with this, okay? We know how to do, deal with and train and develop, okay? And so if we think about it through the lens of 5.3, I think it demystifies a little bit of, of the use of generative AI. So thanks for your question. There's a question way in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, General, uh, Major Fabiani Duarte, um, uh, thank you so much for your presentation uh, and thanks for being one of our leaders. Uh, as um, you gave examples as somebody from, from the top who's helping us to, to lead the charge to, to be on the cutting edge here, uh, for those of us who are lower ranking and uh, um, I guess less uh, fashionably inclined, uh, uh, how, how do we, um, uh, from the bottom up, try to lead this charge, especially in the academic uh, uh, realm where some of us are entering? Um, so, and I know you're off to go teach. Um, uh, I would actually start to practice and have your students, right, um, to leverage and use, uh, use chat GPT um, or other generative AI skill sets. Um, give them some, I'll, I'll give an example of one of our comp sci classes uh, at the Air Force Academy. Um, the first lesson, the first assignment, our, the, the four class cadets, our freshmen, are required to create the code all on their lonesome. The second, they can use generative AI to help them when they're stuck. The third, they've got to use generative AI to produce the whole thing. What does that enable them to do? It enables them to learn. First, they got to get really good at prompt engineering. They've got to get really good at the task that they're specifying. They get to understand the root of, of, of the principles that they're learning so that they know when they're getting information that doesn't sound quite right. Um, we've got to generate and leverage expectations and give practice to our folks. And that happens not just at a one-star level, that happens at an 04 level. Um, so how do we give our people an opportunity and space to learn, some top cover to learn? Um, and so in terms of, uh, of, of preaching up, scare your senior leaders to death. Okay. Give them examples of what and how generative AI is going to revolutionize the legal profession and that if we don't start now, we're going to be behind. Think not only from a U.S. perspective, but there are countless examples, and I'm happy to tell, talk to you afterwards as well, um, on how um, generative AI and the, the spoofing issue right, um, in, in the Ukraine conflict, how it is being used right now. Um, with respect to training data. So, yes, sir. Writing is a writing is a difficult skill. Um, and writing, not for Chat GPT, it's not. <laughs> which is part of my concern and my question to you. Uh, the red pen <laughs> helps teach that next generation. Do you believe that there'll be erosion uh, in the next generation to come if we don't? if this supplants the process of learning to write. No, and I, I think that's a, so the question is basically, oh my goodness, is this going to eliminate the red pen and, and that process of learning to write? Um, do you have kids? I've got two. All right. So once upon a time, they were in first grade and they learned how to add all on their own. And now what do they do? They use a calculator. I think we are going to need to teach the basic fundamentals of writing. I love, 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 love Strunk and White. Um, I will take Strunk and White any day of the week. Um, and uh, you can ask my poor XO, okay? Um, she has her very own copy now, okay? Um, uh, and so writing as a process and the rules, I do believe there is a time and a place. But I think we also, just like we now expect that our students know how to use a calculator. I believe we're going to need to expect that our students know how to leverage generative AI to not just write, but to also edit, to refine, et cetera. And I'll close with this, and it's, a, it's an example. Um, I have a, an 18-year-old son. He's a senior in high school. Okay. Uh, he has a professor, an English professor. She has a PhD in high school. This is awesome. Amazing English. She sends and writes the most beautiful emails. They are multi-paragraph. They are exquisitely drafted. Okay, I read every email that she sends with, oh, they're, they're beautiful. My husband gets the same emails. He immediately files them in the trash. Why? Because I read them. <laughs> My son takes her emails puts it into chat GPT and says, give me the five most important things that I need to know out of her email. And he gets it like that. 
That is leveraging the power and the tools of generative AI, and that's what we need to be teaching our young people. Here, here. With that, thank you all very much. I seriously defy anybody to show me a better hour of ethics training on planet Earth than what you just heard. I mean, it is timely, uh, insightful, everything. I, Linnell, I did record and put it in generative AI to say, you know, assess this presentation. It says, General Latendra has taken the savvy, stylish ABA rules, <laughs> ABA rules and to advance her environmentally sensitive clothing line. Nice. <laughs> no, really. That was unbelievably fabulous. Uh, we will eventually put it online with your permission. And I think this is something that everybody, every law student, everybody in the legal profession, and I would suggest beyond that, because, I, General, I don't know if you're thinking what I'm thinking, is, and what you were thinking, you alluded to at the end, ChatGPT in the targeting process and so many other, even when we're doing logistics, we, this needs to be internalized on planet Earth. That means I talk too long. You know, that was genuinely creepy. <laughs> anyway, well, let's give her another hand, and then we'll take a 10-minute break.